one preparing to live stream content is being shared yes when live stream setting up meeting appears to be working that's good news done redirecting to youtube okay we are now preparing to live stream we're live there's our echo shared. it's yes. alive we're alive <laughs> Okay, welcome to our live stream YouTube audience. We are cooking. And now we're going to hit record on the local moment. Three, two, one, record on this computer. Go. Okay, good evening, boys and girls. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to FractalU.com. As you know, I'm Dan Winter, FractalField.com, FractalU.com. And I'm joined by Tufan Guven, our co-host, as usual, who is also our speaker tonight. Tufan is here. They just spent a week here assembling the PiezoFire.com, which in part thanks to Shelly and many people, the PiezoFire la launch went, went amazing. The PiezoFire piezoelectric oscillators are working amazingly well. Just worked with the Spanish doctor yesterday who was amazed, pain in his hand, pain in his back. And, and I had this great experience where the I hadn't used the inductor coil, the Tesla coil part of piezofire.com as much. And I found out yesterday that we did get a dramatic cooling effect with the inductor coil part of piezofire.com. A lady had a serious pain in her lower back and the cooling effect was quite dramatic and indicates, you know, implosion, non-destructive compression, neg entropy, all the good stuff. So I was pleased. I had usually been using the piezo part, but the inductor part was also cool. So the piezofire.com launch went so well, as you know, that um, uh, there's a there's a queue. There's still uh, more demand than supply. And it, we're about, are we about two weeks now, Patrick? Something like that for the piezofire? Um, two shipments? weeks. We're about, yeah, about two, two and a half weeks. Yeah, about two weeks because people are enjoying them and that's cool. And, oh, we have another announcement. Our uh, international conference cooking so fun for September 19th, South France, fractalfield.com slash 2024. We have a, a new announcement. The website will contain more, much more information about the speakers very soon. But the new announcement, and this is exciting, new announcement, is that Bridget Nielsen, from Sedona originally and fresh from her Gaia TV series will be joining us in South France and we'll be talking about ancestor memory and healing family memory and her work with lucid dreaming and uh, healing trauma and her work in the women's mystery. So famous Bridget Nielsen, whom you've seen so many times on our interview, is coming to South France, going to be joining us. It's fun. And there's a little plan cooking for a bit of a grail tour thereafter. So anyway, <laughs> the South Great. France... <laughs> yeah. South France. And by the way, yes, we go ahead, have go ahead. already sold out more than half of the rooms in less than a week. So if you are planning to attend, please hurry up. <laughs> That's right. It, it's kind of amazing. And it's sort of a first for us. But, you know, we had 41 rooms there in that beautiful venue you see on the website. And indeed, more than half of them are already gone in the first week. So it, it appears we're going to have a, a good party here in South France. Please come and play with us because it's going to be the most fun. And let's see, any other announcements? Oh, Tufan, shall we announce what is next week's presentation? Do we, yes. we normally next do? week, Veda Austin is going to give a presentation at Fractal Field at Fractal U about consciousness and life force crystallizing geometry in water. I think this is going to be one of the extremely exciting uh, subjects that we will be covering in this series. Her website is vedaaustin.com. And uh, so Veda has beautiful updates, uh, you know, since Emoto's work, when we will be seeing the real face of water, I'm already uh, greatly excited. Yeah, Veda Austin is also quite famous and also from, from Gaia TV and, and elsewhere. And uh, we did an interview with her before, and she really has a great baraka and amazing stories of the, you know, what the spiritual, the energy influences on water crystallization. Great work. She's become a real voice for that work, and we're glad that she agreed to join us next week, fractalu.com. Uh, so uh, I think we did the announcements. Now the next step is to introduce Tufan's lecture for this evening. And Tufan's lecture for this evening is entitled... Uh, or Ideal Dynamics. Toroidal dynamics implosion, and yes. I have I have just a little short story I thought I would tell just a two minute warm up for Please Tufan's <laughs> Tufan's presentation. He's played prepared some amazing slides, and actually um, Patrick's prepared some visuals for part of this as well. So here's my little short story. So as many of you know, 
for something on the order of 30 years. Oh, my God. Uh, I was a speaker involved with the U.S. Psychotronics uh, Lecture Circuit. And, you know, one of the core things that the Psychotronics Lecture Circuit had to deal with for all those years was something very simple. The psychotronics in this sense meant psychologically active electrical circuits, basically. And the core mystery, the core mystery of psychotronics was this simple little phenomena, which was, if you take a chunk of wire and touch the two ends of that wire to a car battery, it'll burn burn your hands and it'll be nasty. However, if you wind that same chunk of wire a few feet long into a caduceus coil and touch the same chunk of wire to that car battery, the wire will stay cool. But if you point it at somebody, they will feel nauseous in their stomach. Hello. Now, this is a pretty simple phenomena. Like, okay, what did a caduceus coil did to that chunk of wire that turned that DC current into something that made you feel nauseous in your solar plexus? Well, actually, you know, after 30 years in psychotronics, I'd have to say my general impression is that we in the psychotronics movement, after 30 years of research, still functionally did not have a clue to answer that question. <laughs> That's my humble opinion. Anywho, now, for the first time, after that 30 years of rank ignorance, <laughs> we really know what was happening. That when that DC current is folding recursively in then out in a caduceus shape, idealized by golden ratio, what is happening is that that DC waveform in the cross points is recursively folding back into itself aligning the longitudinal component at the tip of the pine cone. So it was actually when the transverse component going up and down gets realigned into being a compressional or longitudinal component, then you feel that compression in your solar plexus. So the answer to that question was simple, focused longitudinal EMF plasma projection. And after 30 years in the psychotronics movement, I don't think anybody ever was able to express that concisely. And yet, now tonight when Tufan is speaking about uh, coils and toroidal dynamics, we're going to be speaking about the difference between a toroidal coil and what we call a pancake coil, uh, which in the case of piezofire.com uh, and uh, uh, Patrick showed you the patents in his presentation on piezofire.com that you have a bifiller Tesla coil wound into a pancake, a flat coil. And that's what we're about to discuss is because that coil is flat. You see, if it's if the coil was toroidal, then the all of the different angles of the wave front are propagating. But if that coil is flat, then a larger component of the propagating indu inductive field, flat plasma projection, literally your aligning more and more of the longitudinal or compressional component. So the flat coil and the flat face of the flat piezotransducer in both cases are increasing the amount of the inertia of the electromagnetic field propagating, which is aligned in a longitudinal component as opposed to the transverse. So aligning into the longitudinal compressional creates the magic, obviously. So this is something we're thinking about now. We're talking about toroidal dynamics. And that was my two cents worth of the psychotronics history. And now we introduce Tufan Guven. Please take it away, Tufan. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Did, did I spoil the fun? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Okay. All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is Tufan Guven, a representative at geometricmodels.org. So I'm going to share my um, presentation now. Sharing screen. I spoiled the fun. Oops. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Tufan has a great smile, you know. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, tonight we will talk about, as Dan said, um, the physics of implosion, toroidal dynamics. And um, I would like to start my presentation with the famous quote, God is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere. So this quote often attributed to medieval philosophers and mystics 
uses the metaphor of a sphere to describe the nature of God as being omnipresent and infinite. The idea that the center is everywhere suggests that God is present at the every point in the universe, accessible from anywhere and intimately connected to all things. And the notion that the circumference is nowhere implies that God's presence has no boundaries or limits encompassing all of existence without being confined to any physical or conceptual limits. So linking the concept of God as a sphere with an omnipresent center and an unbounded circumference to the geometry of a torus offers a fascinating perspective. A torus characterized by a central hole and a continuous surface can symbolize infinity and the cyclical nature of existence. Now, the center of the torus, which can be seen as analogous to, you know, to the everywhere center of the sphere, represents a point of universal presence. While its donut-shaped form, looping back onto itself, mirrors the idea of no definitive boundary. This comparison enriches the metaphor suggesting a divine presence that is both central and pervasive embodying an eternal cycle within the universe. Integrating the torus geometry with the concept of universal consciousness, the torus's scale invariant nature aligns with the idea of a consciousness that pervades the universe at all levels. This suggests that, much like the torus, consciousness does not have a single centralized location, but is instead a continuous omnipresent field that connects all forms of existence across various scales. The torus, with its infinite loop, represents the endless and boundless nature of consciousness, reflecting a universal interconnectedness and the cyclical flow of energy and information. And you can find more information at Dan's website at goldenmean.info slash DNA and we have been uh, teaching for years that actually consciousness or perception is self reentry to experience itself. So what we call memory is that again, self reentry. So what we memorize or what we remember is the field that is circling and coming back to our consciousness. So it's the same toroidal dynamics we are talking about. It, and we call it non-destructive self-reentry, and that's where the alphabet animation came from it at the DNA ring. And, you know, I, I'd like to just suggest that the everywhere at once metaphor is really useful. And in another way, we get more specific when we see that at the places in that array where self-reentry or compression is more successful, that that's where the presence is increased. So that, in effect, we're saying the presence then really relates the idea of an, an array. Yes, that also reflects the, you know, um, the, the connectedness of all consciousness in the universe at all scales as it is the scale invariant nature. And uh, so I would like to focus on the two um, components, two uh, qualities of the toroidal field. So one, one is a centrifugal force and the other one is the centripetal force. So... The centrifugal force is, as you see on the left uh, picture, when you throw a stone to a pool or, a, or water, you will see that the rippling effect goes outwards. It's like an explosion. It goes outwards, it extends. And the reverse is uh, when you see a whirlpool, the charge tends to gather, tends to come to one place. So. It's the implosive effect, the centripetal force. And the torus has both of those forms on its topology. You can observe that. This is the centripetal force. It goes inwards. And on the other side, as it does that, the other side goes outwards. You'll see that it's the centrifugal force. And both of those sides have different qualities. One is yin, one is yang. And the implosive side is the biomagnetic south attracted to north and vice versa. 
and, and later we relate compression and rarefaction to plus and minus charge. Yes. And even yes. looking at which side plus and minus on the magnet would increase pain where, where the other side would increase healing. Uh, so decreasing the pain side is the centrifugal side of the DC magnet, for example. Right. And the centripetal component is mostly and widely observed in structures like uh, black holes, uh, whirlpools, where you see the charge is gathered. And uh, in physics, uh, the black hole is another definition of transduction of energy because of its implosive quality. And, and the key word here being charge collapse. <laughs> yes. Um, so in physics, the catenoid was used to describe the function of uh, transduction in wormholes of energy, as I said, the higher dimensional, to influx into our 4D space and time with its unique topology. So you can see that uh, the toroidal um, surface consists of two curvatures. One is the negative curvature and one is the positive curvature. The negative one is the part that is inside and the positive one is the one outside. And the catenoid is very instructive because it has some unique qualities that we will talk about uh, that uh, when the charge collects and gathers in the specific phase conjugate geometry perfected by golden ratio has the miracles that we call negantropy, tuning to Planck, and many other. Uh... <clears throat> so um, the cotonoid holds some of the most intriguing functions in physics and key to transduction due to its topology and the specific path of charge flow on that topology, aka non-destructive charge collapse defined by Dan Winter. And golden ratio perfected fractal charge collapse is the way where the charge field in this centripetal force imploder, implodes and conjugates with the golden ratio, specifically golden ratio sequences, as phi is the only ratio which allows wavelengths to both add and multiply constructively. This is the pine cone kissing noses metaphor. <laughs> yes. And we know that Earth's magnetic field, also known as the geomagnetic field, is a toroidal magnetic field extending from the Earth's interior out into space. So this magnetic field is not only a toroid, but it's a twistor where toroidal fields are recursively created within each other and become scale invariant, as you see on the top picture. And uh, as we have said, because of the scale invariant nature of the toroidal fields, we can link consciousness um, in the universe in multiple scales. And this is a magnetoreception. The evidence of magnetoreception in humans suggests subconscious ability to respond to Earth's magnetic field. And this shows that the human consciousness is directly connected with the sun's uh, electromagnetic fields, the solar flares. And a research paper published in the Journal of Neuroquantology proposes a fractal and holographic model of understanding the connection of consciousness at all levels, as we just talked about, from micro to macro, and from the cellular level or even the quantum level, starting from the most fundamental scales to star systems, galaxies, and even the universe. This is called scale invariance, where fractal and holographic systems, in this case, are perfectly embedded one another, independent from their scales. Also a definition of perfect embedding for entanglement. And the study connects this intricate relationship of consciousness among the universe with the torus form. It's it's nice to see that scale invariance is obviously associated with fractality, which is associated with non-destructive compression. It's obvious that the only perfect form of compression is fractal. But think about more there is the fact that that successful compression means you gain energy during collapse 
And that implosion is the reason gravity exists and consciousness. So to end life force and the reason seed germinate. So the ability to gain energy during collapse, that is the key to consciousness, gravity, and life force. Right. And we will be talking about consciousness in our upcoming science and alchemy of consciousness event in South France, uh, 19th of September. So if you're interested, please join us. Details at fractalu.com. Sorry, fractalfield.com slash uh, 2024. And um, one of the very intriguing facts is that the torus geometry, the torus field, uh, understanding of the torus dynamics was utilized by ancient alchemists. And this was integrated in their uh, ancient uh, structures. And we can see uh, the examples of that in different locations around the world. One of them being the Star Summer Palace. This so, was uh, Vincent yes. Bridge's favorite building in Prague. And he said basically the Battle of Mount White, the uh, Battle of White Mountain and the survival of the alchemy school was remembered in that fractal building. Yes. So I really love this building. And uh, to give you a little bit of background about the alchemical collection of Prague, so Prague was once considered to be the center of alchemy in Europe, where almost all the alchemists between the 14th and 17th century spent some time in. So a few years ago, I was lucky enough to visit the Star Summer Palace during uh, Roger's beautiful Alchemy of Prague conference, which he still does. And um, <clears throat> so th this was basically a philosopher's retreat with its architecture influenced from astrology, symbolism, and alchemical principles from the era. So it was the first time that I had ever heard of a palace embedded on a giant torus, basically. Star Summer's palace is not only well planned to be on magnetic crossings, but its plan is also constructed to focus, embed the energy lines to its center, at the center of its attention, which is to say perfect nesting embedding within the torus. So there are a couple of um, ancient uh, buildings uh, and uh, sacred sites that have this understanding. The other one is from the Pyrenees, uh, the Abbey of Saint Michel de Cusa. So uh, of course there is no official explanation as to uh, what kind of chemical functions these chambers served. So we hypothesize advanced alchemical rituals were likely conducted within these toroidal chambers, leaving the specifics and the extent to your imagination. And the reason it's called St. Michel, it's literally on the Michael line, as well as on the, uh, the pilgrimage of Compostelle, a field effect of stars. And in that toroidal crypt, your hair stands up regularly. And obviously what's happening is charge compression. Yes. So uh, coming back to the body's electromagnetic field and the torus field or aura field, Glenn Ryan in his article, Biological Effects of Quantum Fields and Their Role in the Natural Healing Process, 1998, explains the toroidal fields in relation to biofields, free energy devices, and healing processes. It's an amazing article. If you haven't read it, please go online and check it. It's again, biological effects of quantum fields and their role in the natural healing process. In a nutshell, Ryan used his experimental evidence as the basis for a model which introduces the concept of a biofield composed of at least three layers comprising force fields, potential fields, and quantum fields embedded within one another like a twist store. The model further proposes that healing information originates from a higher dimensional source and is transformed into biologically usable electromagnetic energy as it propagates through the layers of the biofield. And twist stores or torus magnetic fields are being emitted by the heart. Dan Winter who is credited in the literature for inventing the word heart coherence, emphasizes that compassion is learned when emotional pictures inside our hearts become 
so self-similar or fractal that they become a fractal attractor sucking the outside in, therefore creating attraction towards others who have similar emotions in their hearts. Which is to say the physics of compassion <clears throat> is successful compression. And what's cool was that it's so easily measured, you take the EKG and the more harmonics present, the more you're feeling. <laughs> also a definition for the science of resonance. This recursive turning inside out becomes the implosion, which is the electrical rush associated with feeling and the law of attraction. The electrical model of the heart's increasingly harmonic inclusive fractality makes perfect compression and makes perfect compassion is electrically identical. This gives new insight into why the healthy heart is a fractal heart. So nicely said. Uh, summarized realheartcoherence.com with the help of Patrick. Yeah. We have talked about <clears throat> consciousness and perception, about being self reentry in space and time. So, the reason why plasma fields chose to manifest themselves in this profound toroidal form is because they had to find a self-sustaining, self-organizing recursive geometry to optimize their survival energy, basically. And we know from hydrodynamics that the three axes of rotational spin allows the only self-sustaining shape. So you can see the toroidal air bubble that a dolphin blows underwater here. So beautiful. And this is the map of the local world uh, in the in uh, our galaxy. And he on the left picture, left picture and right picture actually is the same. It's just uh, I have added a toroidal field on the right one. And you can clearly see on the left one that the Milky Way actually at the center of these three axes. And you can see how star systems are spiraling to the center, just like the toroidal field, just like following a spiral line. So um, try to imagine the golden spiral wrapped torus symmetry, uh, picture on the bottom left, creating perception by golden ratio conjugation at center is then suggested where our galaxy is located. Apply the golden spiral on the torus above and see the grand attractor under the centripetal force and you can observe the trajectory spiraling inside arc, grand attractor, Virgo, etc. Beautiful. <clears throat> and um, the toroidal dynamics have been uh, utilized by ancient alchemists and uh, many ancient languages, alphabets have been influenced with this understanding. And basically with the sacred alphabets, we see the implosive field that is being inserted inside the toroidal implosive charge collapse field. And that specific whirlpool or energy implosion is uh, specifically used to differentiate um, letters in sacred alphabet. So this is basically how you, they were composing the uh, sacred language and then blowing that donut inside, inside their heads, inside their optical vortex, vortex uh, hologram, cortex hologram. And this is a good place to meditate on. We were saying in the last short that uh, Tufan and I made together that your consciousness is a vortex in the superfluid of plasma or charge. And that is the only thing you take with you when you lose a dream and you, when you die. So as we look at these pictures, the question we might be asking is, well, where do you get the inner muscle to steer that tornado? Because that's what you are when you're lucid dreaming and you know when you're dead. Yes, but to simplify, uh, the spiral that is being used in this specific ancient Hebrew language 
is the spiral on the toroidal topology. So when you pay attention to the trajectory of the spiral, right, it goes around the toroidal topology three times until it connects back to itself. And <clears throat> if you can cut, visualizing that, imagining that you cut the torus from the um, circumference into two, and after you cut that, you take out that spiral out. And when you take that spiral out and observe it from different perspectives, that 3D spiral becomes the letters, the sacred letters, as in the um, ancient Hebrew alphabet. So originally, the golden spiral wrapped torus symmetry indexing field effect created and created the sacred alphabets. In simple terms, in Hebrew alphabet, we have spiral on a donut angled into compression indexed by the spin of the tetrahedron, seven axis tetracube perspective. Focusing on a Hebrew letter in your brain will cause the plasma donuts, which is your optical cortex hologram, to be tilted to that phase angle and you blow that donut in your brain and send that smoke ring at that phase angle, that vortex, and nest them properly, like dolphins blow the donuts underwater. And, and, and we said that's one way to imagine how the, the ancient rabbi was making a golem, was just blowing smoke rings of plasma at the right symmetry angle using Hebrew, which is effectively also how you make the atomic table out of vortex. <laughs> yes. So um, I would like to emphasize the importance of the spirals where we will continue the subject from. And the pictures that we have used are from the uh, Taurus poster that if anyone is interested, they can find it at geometrymodels.org. So the Discover magazine asks, why is our universe filled with spiral? And the obvious answer is because the qualities of the universal energy are it's compressible, it behaves like a fluid, stores inertia when it rotates, and in certain geometries, like fractal, conjugate, etc., it appears to self-organize and become intelligent and alive. And you can read more details of the principles, universal principles, at uh, Dan Winter's latest book, plankfire.com. So the spirals are everywhere in the universe, in animals, plants, galaxies. And this one is an actual picture of an exoplanet being born around the young star AB Auriga. Auriga. So this could, this could be the first direct evidence of early planet formation in a young stellar disk. And uh, we see the similar principles that we just talked about about the nature, about the qualities of the universe, that it's being compressible, behaves like a fluid, stores inertia, and it rotates. And you can see that I have applied the golden spirals on this geometry, and you can see how it fits perfectly to the to this new uh, burning young star. It was those ideas of compressibility as above, so below that I first outlined in what, what Vincent Bridges says was the new emerald tablets of Thoth, as above, well, so below, was really referring to that principle of implosive fractality, that it starts out as simply a superfluid, that because it's compressible and stores inertia, the inertia stored by rotation is called mass, and the period of that rotation is called time. So rotation, idealized by the golden spiral, is the only not only the only definition and origin of both mass and time. And um, <clears throat> it's very interesting, intra ins instructive to understand the catenoid uh, to explain some of the mysteries of water when it comes to changing qualities in certain conditions. And we will talk about that in our next class with Veda Austin, definitely. So this subject brings us to a dream portrayed by the famous Victor Schauberger, a hero of implosion science and the pioneer in the quantum physical study of nature's subtle energies. Schauberger successfully demonstrated 
how to purify water naturally and harness its colossal power by developing powerful machines based on implosion technology with phase conjugate geometry. So basically, he was uh, generating electric power from his piezo mineral doped water and uh, that piezo mineral dropped water vortex at the point where it spontaneously got colder a clue to cold plasma, while reminding the vortex being a catenoid form with the function of transduction of higher states of energy, it is very rewarding to think of the implosion water technology as means of altering qualities through the centripetal negantropic charge implosion. More details at fractalfield.com slash cold plasma. Go ahead, Dan. That, that, that was a fractalfield.com slash Schauberger translation. We have a lot of those visuals. So the device, the top three left, is called a repulsine. And it's also important to note that that piezo vortex, if the angle of vortex was right, would columnate and convert the transverse EMF back into longitudinal EMF. And with that, Schauberger made gravity. <clears throat> And moreover, what Schauberger did by intuition, Dan Winter did by equation, the precise geometry behind hydrogen system by applying golden ratio to the physics of water, creating life affirming water. The exact geometrical principle with golden ratio perfected charge compression is applied in the imploder water, water systems, which are available at the imploder.com. So it's important that we understand the geometry of implosion uh, based on or perfected by golden ratio. Because it's, it's just to say it's notable that those imploders, they do have dramatically more power if the water has mineral or is hard water because it makes the vortex piezo. It literally can create a spark. And so then when the vortex is piezo, hard water like Schauber or Schauberger and Steiner, they doped it with the... Uh, a piezo quartz rock powder. And so that the mineral in that water makes it piezo. And that's what puts high voltage at the neck of that vortex. Yes. And together with the geometry that is specifically aligned with the golden ratio phase conjugate implosive um, spirals that helps <clears throat> implode much better, I suppose. Which is literally how that we then proved is how hydrogen is built. <laughs> yes. So if you if anyone asks why golden ratio is very important, because phi is the only ratio which allows wavelengths to both add and multiply constructively, basically. So it's the geometry that, or it's the ratio that contains both arithmetic and geometric progression together, which is the only ratio in the whole uh, universe of mathematics. <clears throat> And that's the proof of the solution to compression. And the solution to compression is the solution to everything. <laughs> Consciousness, alchemy, implosion. Yes. <laughs> solution to compression is everything. Yes. And geometrically, one can visualize this understanding by applying or drawing a star within a star within a star, basically. Because that can reflect the idea that we have been talking about how Phi is the only ratio that allows both wavelengths to add and multiply constructively, constructively you know, uh, displays it perfectly because all these sequences in this geometry on the right side perfectly shows the perfect implosive charge collapse geometry because it's all based on phi. All these divisions are uh, in line or coherent with this same proportion. And this is literally the, every face of the Star Mother kit. <laughs> right, right. So as we have said, golden ratio of phase conjugation turns charge compression into charge acceleration towards center, the gravity. And uh, when that charge is being accelerated, a portion of that energy is directly transmuted into from uh, transverse to longitudinal at the node point. And so that means to gain energy during collapse. That is the motor which drives gravity and life force and consciousness. Yes. And uh, this is the 
exact principle that the universe utilizes at specific node points. And what we have been teaching uh, in this program and what Dan has been telling in this program is the physics and the fundamentals of understanding those node points where they align specifically and support life force. This is the exact uh, universal frequency cascade that Dan has Dan and his partners have, they have uh, applied this to numerous technologies, one of them being the last one being the piezo fire. And all of these technologies are based on the understanding of the universal frequency cascade, which is exactly tuned to Planck constant. <clears throat> uh, so it is important because the same understanding of frequencies, they uh, affect and create the most uh, critical molecular uh, functions and the energetic functions in humans, animals, um, plants like photosynthesis, and they also dominate the celestial time cycles like the um, Earth year, Earth Venus year, the galactic year, precession of the equinox. <clears throat> and another easy way to visualize this is that in our earlier classes, we talked about the constructive wave interference. <clears throat> if um, anyone here has not watched the earlier class, um, I would suggest to go and watch my first class, which was a basic intro to charge collapse. We talked about constructive wave interference and other um, charge collapse dynamics among uh, other areas. Um, so when we can uh, understand how this negantropic field uh, happens at specific points, these are all the golden ratio conjugation points, golden ratio meeting points of the waves. And the universe has um, organized this fractally, recursively, in relation to golden ratio starting from the Planck constant. And if you can imagine the tip of this left part as the Planck constant, all of these um, conjugating wave points are the node points of what we have been talking about. And this is the this is a representation of the universal frequency cascade. At those specific whirlpools where the energy is gathered, where implosion happens, these are the exact negantropic life-supporting bioactive fields where this has been also uh, used in many cancer treatments based on uh, published articles. Those frequencies are already well established and known. And uh, what we are doing is just taking those frequencies and applying it to this <clears throat> uh, new devices like piezo fire. And you can <clears throat> visualize those vortexes along this chart where ADP, ATP uh, regulates <clears throat> the frequencies. It's specifically the three exact hydrogen radii as discovered by Dan Minter the dimensions of the DNA, photosynthesis, Schumann period, and so on. So it is fractal. And the New Scientist magazine agrees with us that the universe is fractal. And the um, frequencies are the uh, building blocks of the universe being fractal. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, Tufan, this might be a good time to maybe if you want to back up uh, one or two pictures there. But uh, yeah, a, a good time to answer two questions. Uh, NZ asked, what is the correct angle in the vortex that makes the transverse into the longitudinal? Maybe back up one more picture even because you got that perfect. Yeah. So that pine cone uh, is a 60 degree angle. Actually, if you because see, if you take the star mother kit, actually, you don't have a star mother kit in your hand, do you too fun? No. But, <laughs> but the star mother kit is a dodeca inside a dodeca, pentodeca. And the angle that nests the pent inside the pent infinitely is precisely a 60 degree vortex cone. So that actually is the idealized vortex cone because it implodes pent dodeca inside pentodeca, the only possible 3D fractal. 
which is how hydrogen is built and how you make the perfect implosive vortex, and therefore how you convert transverse to longitudinal. Because obviously you've got to line up the transverse components, which are going up and down, into optimized translation of vorticity down the caduceus, down the pine cone. So the short answer is actually a 60 degree angle. Now it's true, the pyramid, Pyramid angle has a role in here too, but that's where the, the phi and the pi meet. And that's a bit of a, another story. So the perfected vortex in the nested dodeca and transverse to longitudinal, for example, how gravity is built is definitely a 60 degree cone. And then last, so NZ also asks, why energy is gained during collapse? Now that is a fundamental question. How and why is there an energy gain during collapse? If you knew, you would not only know why implosion exists, but you'd know how, why hydrogen exists. You'd know why gravity exists. You'd know why life force exists. You'd know why consciousness exists. So I think it's pretty important to know why energy is gained during collapse. <laughs> and what we hypothesize here is that because they're crossing in golden ratio, <clears throat> that a portion of the inertia of the wave cross points adds and multiplies recursively, constructively, not just the wavelength, but the phase velocity, the speed of the wave front. And because the speed of the wave front is adding and multiplying recursively constructively, a portion of the energy of compression is converted into the energy of acceleration towards center, gaining energy during collapse, named the gravity. So this is, this is new information. You know, no physicist on this planet has a clue yet to why object fall to ground. And here we have a very, very compelling hypothesis because we have a smoking gun, the geometry of hydrogen. So that's how you gain energy during collapse. The reason implosion exists because of perfected golden ratio fractality, where the phase velocities add and multiply constructively the perfected heterodyning. And that creates acceleration of charge towards center and acceleration toward, of charge towards center is otherwise known as the gravity. So now for the first time, you can tell your five-year-old why objects fall to the ground. Okay, anyway, I carry on. Please, too Thank fun. You. There was two you. questions in the list, so. Thank you. <clears throat> And based on that understanding, I have designed and developed the Planck tuner, which perfectly shows you the exact um, Planck scales that are multiplied with golden ratio. So if anyone is interested about the Planck tuner, they can check it on germanchickmodels.org. So and that means you can did. design things easily, which optimize charge collapse, for example, right. sacred space. <laughs> Yes, like architects or artists, they can design yes. their works based on the understanding of uh, scaling and exactly tuning it to Planck by developing their artwork. And uh, I would also like to invite everyone to check the Planck set because we have Dan's latest book inside here, the Planck Tuner, the Star Mother Kit, which is also like almost very close to our Planck scale. The tablet of Shamash also includes the uh, measurements of the Planck scale on it and the uh, posters that we have gone through. That's actually a beautiful picture of the Star Mother kit there. It shows your pent inside pen. It's a really nice image of the Star Mother kit right there. <laughs> right. Thank you. So <clears throat> this is a picture of a Tesla coil. <clears throat> and um, most Tesla coil designs have a smooth spherical or toroidal shape metal electrode on the top of the uh, high voltage terminal. So in the beginning of the 20th century, Tesla first developed and applied self-canceling coils and demonstrated that such a coil could transmit energy over long distances without losses. And after this, many scientists have developed breakthrough technologies like toroidal electromagnetic field generator technologies, which have the potential to substitute the need for petrochemical resources. Uh, unfortunately, almost all of them have been suppressed heavily in the past century. But this might be a good place to mention with that picture, maybe go back just to, yeah, just to say that we believe that the reason Tesla didn't finish the job, that indeed you want a very high voltage and that compression point, and that compression point can make a node in the longitudinal array, but Tesla did not succeed with global wireless power because he didn't understand the arrangement of the longitudinal nodes 
have to be the pick up and receive point in the earth grid sacred sites, Dodeki Kosa, and also did not actually have the frequency signature correct. For example, using 50 instead of a 50 hertz, 60 hertz instead of a 50 hertz cascade. So if you didn't have the frequency signature to implode phase conjugate correctly, and you didn't have the longitudinal nodes correct, you're not going to get global wireless power. And we're going to go into that in depth into at pyramidwirelesspower.com lecture upcoming at fractalu.com. Yeah. So um, Tesla has patented many of his inventions. This one is an example from Tesla's bifiller flat pancake coil from 1894. <clears throat> the pancake-shaped bifiller Tesla coil by being a rather flat-faced instead of a toroidal would most likely increase the geometry of the propagating field to have a higher percentage of longitudinal component. In other words, the flat propagating wavefront would inherently be more compressional than transverse, which is to say scalar. <laughs> and obviously, <laughs> go ahead then. Tufan did a great job. We, we, just, we discussed this earlier. The other thing to emphasize about Tufan doing a great job is he's becoming very experienced at building these because this is the design for the coil in piezofire.com. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's inside, right. And obviously, the most bioactive component needed is the longitudinal compressional scalar. In other words, to create centripetal negentropy, Perfect symmetric timed opposing squeezing is the way to create implosive force. The other dominant discovery about the nature of toroidal electromagnetic vorticity in general is that if the angle and symmetry down the throat of that vortex is fractal recursive five base, then the conversion from transverse to longitudinal at that Planck nodes of the pine cone is efficient and that that is the squared gun that makes gravity, the new information. We worked on, so you saw that picture, the side view of the caduceus. So when it's called optimized tra translation of vorticity. So down that caduceus, the transverse is being organized and folded recursively into a more directional longitudinal. And the earlier examples we saw from Lakowski's multiple wave oscillator, um, you can see the uh, flat coil, um, which creates this um, uh, symmetric field effect. So it also had the golden ratio um, proportions, but it didn't have the Planck scale. So Dan Winter and Patrick Botti have perfected this uh, with their um, formulas that they perfectly scale it to Planck with generating the exact frequencies that is needed for the perfect bioactive field. And at this point, I would like to invite Dan Winter and Patrick Botti to this conversation to discuss about the effect of that specific geometry on wellness. Yeah, so we want to propagate a longitudinal. I believe, Patrick, you actually prepared a little visual, didn't you, for us here? Patrick, is that appropriate? So um, when when we take this, the, the, the pancake design, uh, either piezo or in this case, the pancake design of the coil and the Tesla coil oh. in the piezo fire, and when we take that, it creates a rotational component from the toroidal coil in a pancake. And I believe Patrick has a visual for us. Um, I think, um, Tufan, you need to turn off oh, your sure. slide share so that uh, share. Patrick. Yes. Yeah, that's Go right. Ahead. Now we need Patrick to turn on your share. <laughs> I will Patrick share. Normally, is it coming? Yes, it looks like yes, it's, it's coming. coming. Good, good. Yes, yes, all good. <laughs> Super. Yeah, so this is above the coil. Okay. Yeah, you see, so there are two, uh, well, two, two flat coils. Uh, this was the, the first uh, <laughs> prototype that I've, I've built. And if you, it's, it's amazing because if you're using a very low frequency, which is uh, about Schumann frequency, you have the, uh, you have the, this, the small ball which is turning 
clockwise or anti-clockwise uh, when when you send uh, the Schumann frequency to the to the flat coil. And, and the the direction of the coil wind determines the direction of the spin. That's what you're saying, right? Yes, yes. It's, yeah, most of the time, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And it, it's more susceptible to in, entrain embed the long wave spin and the short wave spin when you're at Schumann harmonics, basically. Yeah, and also maybe I can show you another. Well, this is the, well the same thing with the with the the, the one that uh, two family is building. So you see again, uh, it's working. Uh, we got the same result. But what I wanted to show you also is that um, when you you use two flat coil, uh, you you will see immediately with this video that the the field is really 90 degrees uh, from the, the flat coil. So it's it's going away from, from the flat coil, but with 90 degrees. I will show you. So th this is the, uh, the flat, uh, well, maybe I can explain. So this is the flat coil in which I'm sending the frequencies and I'm receiving with the other flat coil which is coming, and uh, this flat coil is uh, well is sending um, its information to the scope, and you see when when it, when we are going close. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> that's it should, cool. It in me, it, it should be in front of each other. Yeah. So you, it, it's it's really ninety degrees uh, direction. The, con the 90 degrees is the conjugate angle. And not, not only is this how they do wireless charging for your mobile phone, but at a deeper level, if you align these things, this is the key to global wireless power, where the sender and the receiver have the same resonance and they're aligned at the longitudinal node. Now you're beginning to understand global wireless power. It's beyond just inductive coupling. You have actually coupling at the nodes for longitudinal array. Go ahead, Patrick. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show them. That, that's, uh, that's beautiful. That is that's really nicely done, Patrick. You could be a pro. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. So the point is, but you see, you're, a, you're seeing efficiency, problem. efficiency of the coupling, um, and so if now if there was an array of these senders and receivers at the dodecaecosa nodes around the planet, like pyramids with mercury vortex aligned in their center, you have very efficient coupling of global wireless power. So what we're gonna explain in more detail at, at pyramidwirelesspower.com lecture at Fractal U in a couple of weeks is how that becomes literally a global wireless power system. Did you have more you wanted to share, Patrick? Or No, I think that uh, that's what you're too fun to ask to, well, regarding this flat coil, uh, the, there were more information from the the previous. Uh, well, also the 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 Shungite is uh, is also reducing. It's it's amazing, yeah, because Shungite is reducing the the amplitude of uh, the frequency we are sending. But uh, it, it's it's strange because the it's uh, it's not reducing completely. Ju just a, a little bit. But but the effect is uh, is improved with Shanghai. It's difficult to explain. But you you told it was uh, quite a big dielectric. Uh... Yeah. So our hypothesis there is that the Shungite being super dielectric, which means simply is charge distribution is efficient within, which means that ch charge wave interference is efficient and constructive, which means. For example, when you have a phase conjugate mirror, you use a super dielectric barium strontium titanate to make a phase conjugate mirror in time reversal. So within the phase conjugate mirror that makes it work is whatever is super permissive where the pine cones can kiss noses because the interference is permitted. So it's a media within which the constructive interference can come to focus. And that's what we're saying, the super dielectric lens, in this case, the, the Shungite, functions as a lens within which the heterodyning can go to completion. 
And that's why it functions as a foci. I'm really thinking yesterday, I had this amazing nurse healer. She had a serious pain in her lower back. And we put exactly this device, the coil with the shungite, in the piezo fire, the Tesla coil part of the shungite. We put it on the front, her front and back, and she experienced a dramatic cooling effect. And that cooling effect, I believe, is because not only was the heterodyning constructive and recursive, but it was implosive, therefore negentropic, and she experienced that cool wind effect, just like Schauberger's vortex. So it's because you have a permissive media within which for the interference to propagate, hence the super dialectic shungite. Okay, so how are we doing, uh, Tufan? Did we finish what you had, or what do you think? Yes, uh, more or less, I finished my presentation. If you have any um, insight or feedback about uh, the yes. visuals oh. and what we should cover. Yes. Well, actually, I think there's a few questions here. I see, I'm see. i seeing a few fun questions. So maybe we... So NZ says, for the visual of Patrick about fields at 90 degrees, if you put a dielectric between the two coils, would the energy still distribute? Would there happen something like capacitive coupling? Well, remember, first of all, the primary component of the, of the coupling here would be inductive coupling in the case of the coil versus the piezo speaker, it would be capacitive coupling. But it's capacitive inductive. It's the same kind of thing. It's coupling. So the, the super dielectric, although Patrick showed, it tended to diffuse it a bit. But we believe that in the presence of the super dielectric, the wave interference can go to completion. For example, if you ask most any physicist on the planet wh what a super dielectric does in order to make a phase conjugate mirror work, they actually don't know. I believe, which is to say, you know, how did how did uh, Nostradamus's uh, scrying mirror work, and how did the Olmec uh, ancestor communication in the Obsidian mirror work? Well, what we believe is that media within which phase conjugation can go to completion, because charge distribution is permissive, called super dielectric, enables the implosion to complete at that at that node, and where the implosion goes to completion, you touch the center of the longitudinal array, which is the physics of clairvoyance, ancestor phone calls, and global wireless power is the coherent longitudinal EMF array. So the Shungite serves a very specific purpose in which it allows the, the wave interference to go to completion, literally implosion at that point. As Adam Davis said, that can be used to explain how many so how so many things interact. So many things can interact where compression is successful, implosion goes to completion, and you connect with the array of nodes, literally the array of the collective conscious, we believe. How does the wave oscillator relate to a labyrinth, Lori says? Well, <clears throat> if you look at the visuals at goldenmean.info slash labyrinth, you'll see... Um, that if you project the seven color donut onto flat land, if you animate the, the projection of the seven color donut onto flat land, you get the seven circuit Cretan Minoan labyrinth. And if you if you walk the seven circuits of the seven circuit Cretan Minoan labyrinth, you often have a bliss experience, especially if you place that labyrinth on the node of the cross point of strong earth magnetic lines, which is, by the way, a central part of our successful South France rain-making episodes at goldenmean.info slash rain. So yeah, it has a lot to do with the labyrinth. Uh, let's see, Bob Sean says, is wireless power possible on smaller local scale or is it practical on a global scale? Well, that's what we're saying is that during the time when the dodeca ecosa sacred space earth grid nodes were in fact constructive standing waves before they ripped the hell out of the earth grid by putting all the metal highways and cities in when the earth grid was alive and well then you could have global wireless power now that they put a uh, uh, you know, one hell of a steel reinforced highway across almost every magnetic line on the planet. Well, the Earth's, gr Earth's grid's a little sick right now, which is why the rain went away. Hello. And until you know what an Earth grid is, <laughs> you got to tell these highway engineers that Gaia ain't going to be Gaia if it ain't negentropic, which means if it stops imploding, well, yes, it will go into chaos because we don't know how to make a grid alive. And so that's our task, is education. But in those cases, it could be global, absolutely, as we're saying. 
Oh, uh, there's somebody here saying, Dan, thank you for saying I can tell my five-year-old grandson why things fall to the ground. Could you say it a little slower and simpler how I can really tell him? <laughs> okay, so what you say to your five-year-old grandson is you find a very nice rose and you have your five-year-old look at the face of that rose. And then you say, uh, the universe is made of waves, just like water, which are called charge. And when waves nest, they naturally form a pattern which allows them to converge, to come to center, which is called a fractal. And it looks just like a rose. Now, if you can visualize this rose very well, the room is going to fill with the smell of roses. And by the way, as the waves cross on the face of that rose, they're going to add and multiply, not just their length, but their speed, their velocity. And so the part of the speed of the waves when they cross and add and multiply will turn only the geometry of the rows among waves will turn that form of compression into acceleration toward center, which is how you gain energy during collapse and the reason gravity exists <laughs> and the reason consciousness exists. That's why the Steiner people always start with a rose. So we'll make another try at that in the, in the lecture on global wireless power. <laughs> uh, let's see, which questions have we not answered, Tufan? Uh, is wireless power, how does it appear? I think I can tell me yes. Yeah, oh, nicely synthesized. Okay, um, so um, the, the summary of the Storal to the Mori to tonight's lecture from Tufan is, it, it actually, in terms of if you want a basic uh, science insight here, is it starts with being able to visualize for yourself the difference between a transverse electromagnetic wave versus a longitudinal or compression. And just like every wave in the ocean, if you, you know, the old story where you plot a wave in the ocean and you see this happening, a circle in a circle. Well, some of that wave is going up and down. That's transverse. Where some of the wave is going like this, that's longitudinal. You know, the famous story about the tsunami in the ocean after the earthquake, it's going at 600 miles an hour, but the boat on the surface does not know that the tsunami just went under the boat because the longitudinal wave went right through and you didn't even feel it. But when the compressional wave, 600 miles an hour, the speed of a jet plane of the tsunami reaches the shoreline, then it goes up the curve, it goes up the, the side of the vortex of the shoreline, and the longitudinal compressional wave pushes against that shoreline, and it's converted from compressional this way into transverse up and down, and that's the 100-foot high wave that kills you when it hits the shore. So the transverse wave is the part that, that hurt when it got to the shore. But the longitudinal wave is how it propagated in the ocean. Now, most sound waves, is mostly the energy is longitudinal. Some of it's transverse, most of it's compressional, like this. Whereas most of the electromagnetics we use for everything on planet Earth, all our communications, et cetera, we only use the transverse component of the inertia of the electromagnetic propagation for all of our electromagnetic communication on this planet. So most electrical engineers, and most of them don't have never even thought about how you would send or receive a longitudinal wave. For example, when you know Kansas propagated a longitudinal radio frequency field and made that cold glass of water burn beautifully because the hydrogen jumped out. <laughs> well, because the the antenna that Kansas used was a spiral on a flat surface, meaning a longitudinal RF antenna, sometimes called circularly polarized. So what that did was it, it focused aligned most of the inertia of, in that case, an RF wave, radio frequency wave, into its longitudinal component. And most electrical engineers don't have a clue how to do that or how to pick it up or, you know, most electrical engineers have never even thought about longitudinal EMF, even though Tom Bearden proved that longitudinal EMF is the definition of gravity waves to start with. And by the way, it's how you make seeds germinate. So maybe they should learn, <laughs> I think. So the reason, one of the backgrounds for uh, Tufan's beautiful visuals tonight is to begin to think about 
how it is, it's a very simple thing. The electromagnetic wave is propagating transverse. Now, if you want to line that up, focus it down a vortex. So out the nozzle of the squirt gun, it propagates aligned longitudinally. Not only is that key to global wireless power and the key to clairvoyance and the key to how you lucid dream and take memory through death. So it's very, very, very important to start to meditate on that. Because, you know, when they said you're going to need the ba from the ka or the rainbow light body or the Kezjan body if you want to take something through death, well, what they're talking about is coherent longitudinal, which means that when your body experiences compression at a sacred site or having a bliss experience, the DNA in your gland converts the transverse electromagnetic of your aura into more focused and aligned longitudinal component. And that can bounce around the earth grid and enter into that array, which is lucid dreaming, which is the song line, which is the stuff, not just of gravity waves, but of ancestor memory. Remember the kids who learn to make that frequencies, those frequencies in their brain waves, suddenly they start seeing their ancestors and their parents freak out. Well, hint, this is the physics of clairvoyance. So it is very, very useful to begin to think about what is the toroidal wave symmetry, which helps convert transverse to longitudinal or scalar. And then you can begin to think about all kinds of cool spiritual stuff with a little bit better than pure woo-woo language. You can talk with electrical engineers. And when you can explain how to take memory through death to a class of electrical engineers, ha then you'll be able to talk to your five-year-old <laughs> and you'll say, hey, this means you need to take very good care of your aura. Hello, what does that mean? Well, it means you don't sit in electrosmog all day. This means you spend time in nature. This means you eat live food. This means you learn sacred dance. Anything to get your aura imploding and producing that coherent longitudinal EMF is literally the stuff of immortality. And by the way, <laughs> It's the stuff of how to make healing energy, which is what's behind all our new toys like piezofire.com, which makes longitudinal. So uh, was that a couple, a couple of questions? If yes, we go, have ahead. Time go ahead, go so, ahead. Uh, Daniel says, vividly illustrator and comprehensive presentation to Fan and Patrick and Dan. I have a question. What effect would a copper plate that's dug into the earth connected to a copper wire and connecting to the wire that piezo Shungai transmitter is connected to. Thanks for your thoughts. Well, the copper plate in the earth uh, will be a good ground, and that will mean it will allow the distribution of the longitudinal component. That's good. I think a way to begin to think about your question might be the classic experiment. You have a copper plate on the roof, picking up the longitudinal wave of the sun and a wire to the basement hooked to another copper plate and the basement is absolutely black, dark, no light and all the plants grow beautifully because they get the longitudinal wave of the sun from that copper plate. Now, that means that the copper plate is able to propagate the longitudinal component, which is actually what makes things grow. Now, if you buried it in the earth, you get a good ground but you would need a rather large amount of charge or inertia in order to ring the whole earth, which is clearly what Tesla was trying to do. And by the way, mostly failed because he didn't know what the longitudinal nodes were, dodeci cosa, and he didn't know that phase conjugation to make longitudinal had to be tuned to Planck. So he got a few things wrong. But notably, when that a wonderful healer later yesterday felt that cooling effect from that longitudinal coil and piezo fire. I was specifically using the third update to our frequency implosion series, which we call the Planck series, which is where we took my equation, Planck times Golan ratio, which lands you on 7.29 hertz. And then we fixed it after we measured the Actually, we measured Sam's Bosnian pyramids and a bunch of pyramids. And we realized that the pyramids on Earth were not using 7.29 hertz golden ratio on its Planck. They are using a slightly modified caduceus for the Schumann harmonics, 7.83 
and multiples hertz, multiples of golden ratio from there. So we tweaked the harmonic cascade for a Schumann implosive Planck cascade. And there we are finding the most psychokinesis because not only are we getting charge collapse, but we're tuning that charge collapse to the earth. Remember Hermes both designed the planets Schumann cascade to be golden ratio to Planck almost. And that difference to almost is 7.29 Hertz theoretical to 7.83 actual. So when we made that adjustment in that frequency cascade, we got more of that quote, cool response because the body says, oh, I just imploded to the charge collapse of the earth and I can distribute into that array. And that's where the self-sorting begins. Literally, that physics of grounding is access to fractality, which is the Schumann cascade. Anyway, so, you know, the, the concept of earthing is very useful and profound here. Another question is, how is cold fractioned plasma created? Is it triggered by the light frequency speed? Um, well, let's just say the concept of cold plasma is interesting because A, cold atmospheric plasma is one of the hottest subjects in all of medicine today. Medical literature today, one of the hottest subjects is cold atmospheric plasma. Why? Because it does so many cool healing things as documented by hundreds of thousands of medical research papers. So cold atmospheric plasma, doctors understand this is cool stuff. <laughs> so what makes it interesting is normally, if you want to propagate a wave of charge where a cloud of charge becomes, will literally stand as a wave, a cloud of charge standing as a wave is called plasma, basically, which means it's a charge is distributing in the media of the cloud of charge, which is the ether itself. But normally it takes a whole lot of power, which is to say heat in order to keep that cloud of charge glowing bright, make the tube bright. However, there are certain conditions where you can get a cloud of charge circulating with almost no heat. And that's called cold plasma, one of the hottest subjects in all of medicine today. Well, we believe very strongly that the, phys the, the physics of the most efficient way to make charge distribution efficient without heat. Remember, heat is only a name for destructive wave interference, and that ain't elegant, no. The elegant way is if constructive wave interference, which means no heat, as in Schauber's vortex that spontaneously got colder, just like the plasma tubes do in several of our devices. So we believe that the solution to getting charge circulation working without heat is the way that compression spontaneously becomes negentropic, namely golden ratio plonkfire.com, phase conjugate charge collapse tuned to Planck. So we think we have the most elegant way of making cold atmospheric plasma because we understand why Victor Schauberger's water piezo vortex spontaneously got colder just before he started making voltage from gravity. We actually understand why. Hello. Because <laughs> it was gaining energy during collapse. Then maybe we should also um, announce that we have extended our Fractal U curriculum by one week and we included a new lecturer. Would you like to do the honors? Yes. So so we've, we've been adding events to FractalU.com because we're having so much fun. So let's just, let's just review. So um, on, well, May okay, so 26th. Yes, thank you. So May, May 26, we have added Jim Egan. Uh, you'll see this at fractalu.com, who made the amazing presentation on the uh, pinhole mirror physics of John Dee's design of the Newport Tower at his newporttowermuseum.com. And his in his last presentation at Fractal U, and you'll see the link there on FractalU.com, May 26. And his talk is going to be John Dee's mathematical cosmology as cryptically explained in his 1564 Monus Hieroglyphica. 
this is going to give us an amazing little fun time because uh, Teresa Burns has been teaching about this for many years, and we have a very different and unique perspective here from Jim Egan. And we would like to know everything we can learn about John D because, <laughs> well, alchemy and past life memories. And anyway, so we, we're very excited. We have added uh, Jim Egan, May 26. On May 19, we have uh, Iris and Alexa teaching about children children's bliss and seeing without eyes. On May 12, we have Juan Schlosser, the bioarchitect with Josh Geiger. Juan Schlosser is who made the original electrical measurements of life force in architecture. So not only is he now doing million dollar sacred temple contracts in India based on the physics of living architecture, but he's the one who made the original measurements with us, proving that life force in architecture is measurable and you can design architecture intentionally and by measurement to cause a seed to grow, thus determining what architect should get a paycheck. The lecture before that is me teaching, why does attention track center of gravity, which is an old Sufi koan. Anyway, so we have a bunch of fun coming up here at fractalu.com. So I think we had our fun tonight. Anybody other final comments, thoughts, suggestions? Too fun? Are you happy? Are we good? We are good. Good. So it's it's been a fun night. I'd like to thank uh, Tufan for preparing a very nice slideshow with us. And Tufan has done amazing due diligence recently in getting us up to speed, uh, producing more of piezofire.com and launching our international conference, fractalu.com slash 2024. So Tufan has been very heroic lately. And and Patrick is uh, with us and been doing great work. And Patrick is going to be with us in South France in September. And look out, you're going to have amazing experience with, with the biofeedback devices. So we're cooking nicely. And I want to thank Shelly for helping us with Piezo Fire. Thank you, Shelly. Blessings, blessings. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> thank you, Jenny, for joining us. Jenny will be with us in South France with the lucidreamteam.com. <laughs> we're, we're cooking on a good party over here. <laughs> Okay, Thanks, everybody. Everyone, for joining. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Blessings, blessings. Thanks, see you next. Everyone. See you. See you next time. You. We had some fun. We had some fun. More fun bye -bye. to come. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>